afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to the, this year's Joan Morrison Lecture in Organism Biology. Uh, we have the privilege this year of having Michael Ryan from the University of Texas at Austin to join us for our, our department's biggest uh, seminar of the year. Before I introduce Mike, I wanted to say a few words about the person who this uh, lecture series is named after. So, Joan Morrison was a central figure in the Department of Biology as well as in the greater scientific community at McGill and abroad. Joan was associated with McGill for over 60 years, starting with her undergraduate career in 1943 to her position as the director of the Bell Institute in 2001. Joan received her PhD from Berkeley, then returned to McGill as, uh, to take an as an appointment as a lecturer in the Department of Zoology and to research marine invertebrates, in particular polychaete worms, from ecological, physiological, and neurobiological perspectives. She was intimately involved in the opening of the Bell Aires Institute in Barbados, and in 1961, she and fellow zoologist John Lewis were the first McGill professors to utilize the research opportunities in, in at, uh, Bell Aires. She became strongly attached to the people and the lifestyle of Barbados and traveled there almost every year for research and personal renewal. Sounds pretty awesome right now. John, Joan Marsden became the chair of zoology in 1969, and during her tenure as chair, she helped form what's currently known as the Department of Biology, which is the synthesis of the Departments of Zoology, Botany, and Genetics. Her accomplishments as a scientist, teacher, and administrator were especially noteworthy for having been achieved during an era in which there are very few women in academia. As a pioneer and role model, she led the way for the many women in the department who enrich our department today. When she retired in 1987, her colleagues established a fund and created the Joan Marsden Lectures in Organismal Biology to perpetuate her memory and to commemorate her accomplishments. This year's Joan Marsden Lecturer, Mike Ryan, epitomizes the values of Joan Marsden of her research in terms of taking the organism as a whole, researching this organism from multiple levels of analysis and from multiple research directions. Mike Ryan is a Clark Hubs Regents Professor in Zoology at the University of Texas in Austin. Mike got his PhD from the Neurobiology and Behavior Program at Cornell, studying with Craig Edler. And thereafter, he worked as a research associate at the Smithsonian Tropical Institute in Panama, and as a Miller Postdoctoral Fellow with uh, David Wake at UC Berkeley. He joined the faculty at the University of Texas in Austin in 1987, where he's been ever since. So Mike uses a variety of different model organisms, ranging from fish to frogs to bats. And he studies them, he studies their behavior, so the evolution of these behaviors, and the neural mechanisms underlying these behaviors. Much of Mike's research focuses on this tumor frog, this teeny tiny frog up there, and that uses these acoustic signals for social communication. And through his years of research, he's turned this sort of tiny organism into this monstrosity of a model system for thinking about behavioral ecology, neural mechanisms, and evolution. Recently, Mike's been looking at sort of the cognitive foundations underlying auditory processing and mate choice, and this is what he's going to talk to us today about. Now, as a whole, just thinking about metrics, since we've been talking about this for our cyclical review, etc., etc., Mike has been a really prolific uh, scientist. So, in total, he's published over 280 papers in top tier journals like Science, Nature, and PNAS, and these papers have been cited over 17,000 times. And one particularly striking example is his paper with Mark Patrick in 1991 titled The Evolution of Mating Preferences in the Paradox of the Lack, which as of five minutes ago was cited 1,033 times. <laughs> Mike has received numerous awards, including the E.O. Wilson Naturalist Award in 2010, and became a fellow of the American Association for the Academy, uh, Advancement of Science in 2012, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2001. Needless to say, Mike has received extensive funding from granting agencies like the National Science Foundation, and given numerous plenary and distinguished lectures on his work. So it's, it's a real pleasure to have Mike here today. I, I've known Mike since I was a graduate student at UT Austin, and I've, I've always emulated him and his lab. His lab has been always prolific, really creative, and since Mike started working with tumor frogs, he's really pushed the system in, in, in a variety of different research directions. And he's made substantive impacts in all these different research fields that he's sort of delved into. And I think it really takes an extraordinary scientist in person to really make that kind of impact in such a diversity of fields. And we're really privileged to have Mike here today to tell us about his work, so I want you all to help join me to give Mike a warm welcome to McGill and Montreal. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, John, and especially. <laughs> 
for the invitation. This is my only the second time that I've been here. Uh, the last time was in the summer to, um, to go to jazz, hear some jazz music. Um, and there was no snow then. <laughs> so what I, as John said, what I've been, what I've been uh, interested in recently is how cognitive architecture of the brain influences the kinds of traits that evolve under sexual selection. And there's a bit of a story before we get to these more recent studies that I want to talk about. So I have to give some uh, background information about this system, about some, uh, basically how it works. But when we talk about sexual selection, we always uh, want to go back to Darwin. And, you know, Darwin was a very private person. And he had a bunch of secrets. We don't know all of them, but one secret that Darwin had is that he was a hypochondriac. And we know that there's probably some good medical reasons for that. It seems that he contracted chakras when he was working in the New World Tropics. We know that he had the psychological challenge of cognitive dissonance because of his religious beliefs uh, slowly clashing with his, uh, his findings in evolutionary biology. But this is the odd thing about Darwin. One of the things that made him uneasy was the sight of a peacock's tail. And as he said to Asa Gray, a famed uh, botanist, whenever he looked at a peacock's tail, it made him sick. Now, why would someone who was, had been exposed to all these wonders of the natural world and had this insatiable thirst for knowledge about biology and geology be sickened by the sight of what many of us think is one of the most beautiful, elaborate traits in the animal kingdom. And the reason was, is because Darwin suggested his theory of natural selection, emphasizing one particular component of fitness. And he, he stated that natural selection was the process by which animals evolved adaptations for survivorship. So when he saw the peacock's feather, this was emblematic of many, many traits that he reviewed in his book, Descent of uh, Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, that didn't fit into this paradigm of natural selection. Because these kinds of traits probably reduced the animal's survival ability. It didn't increase the animal's survival ability. So Darwin suggested another, and he considered sexual selection another hypothesis in parallel to natural selection. And Darwin suggested that there are traits which, even though they can reduce survivorship, they can still evolve under selection, albeit sexual selection, if they enhance the ability to, of the individual to acquire mates. So sexual selection was emphasizing another, a different component of fitness. And that component is the ability to acquire mates. So we know that there's two, in general, there's two important components to fitness, right? Survival and reproduction. And in natural selection, the emphasis really has been on survivorship. And I consider survivorship this trivial little component of an individual that allows it to live long enough to do the important stuff, and that is to try to reproduce. Now, Darwin meant these to be different theories, sexual selection, natural selection. Nowadays, we tend to subsume sexual selection as a part of natural selection. Some people argue strongly that we shouldn't do that. Other people argue strongly that that's the best way to think about selection. To me, it doesn't quite matter. The only, what's important is we realize that there can be many different components of fitness, and selection cannot always optimize the response of a population to all of these separate components of fitness. And we all know that there's lots of evolutionary trade-offs. So I think the argument about whether natural selection and sexual selection are separate are not that important. Now, one thing that Darwin, when he suggested his hypothesis of sexual selection, he said that selection could favor traits that tended to fall into two categories, weapons and ornaments. So selection can, selection can favor traits that enhance ability usually of males, to gain direct access to females for mating, or selection can favor ornaments that females find attractive. And it was this component of the sexual selection hypothesis that caused most of his contemporaries to abandon him and to reject this hypothesis of sexual selection. And the most famous person who battled with Darwin about the idea of sexual selection for a long time was Alfred Wallace. Now, this is an interesting painting. On the right-hand side, this is more in focus here, 
This is a painting by uh, someone in the early 1900s, Abbott Thayer. And Thayer was very influenced by Wallace's view of uh, sexually elaborate traits. Wallace suggested that these traits, these eyes of the peacock's tail, this long train of the peacock tail, evolved to allow peacocks to be camouflaged in dense forest. And this, this painting by Thayer gives an example of how they could. And that's very different than Darwin's view of the peacock's tail and sexually elaborated traits that actually evolved to make animals much more conspicuous. So these two figures here really illustrate Darwin's view of why these traits evolved versus um, Wallace's view. And one thing that Thayer seemed not to realize is you actually don't find peacocks in dense forests, but that's a little besides the point. <laughs> so, how did, so how did these ornaments evolve? This is where people had problems with Darwin's uh, sexual selection hypothesis. And Darwin suggested that females had preferences for certain kinds of traits that they found attractive. And why did they find certain kinds of traits attractive? He said that animals had a sexual aesthetics, just as we have artistic aesthetics. And he said that there are going to be certain kinds of sounds, certain kinds of odors, certain kinds of visual displays that the females are going to find more pleasing than other traits. When Wallace did come around and thought that perhaps sexual selection was real, Wallace took a very different uh, view of sexual selection. And Stephen Jay Gould uh, pointed out nicely, he said, Wallace out Darwin Darwin, where Wallace argued that all of these sexually selected traits were indicative of quality variation amongst males. And Darwin took a very different view than Wallace. So what, he, what, what uh, Darwin is arguing here is that Beauty is very much in the eye of the beholder, and what's implied there is that if we want to understand why sexually selected traits evolve, it's not that they can't be indicators of uh, a mate's quality. It's not that they can't have other functions, but if we want to understand how they evolve, it's very critical to look at these traits through the observer, to ask how choosers are viewing, hearing, smelling. The observers. And to do that, we have to look through the brain. And since it's usually females choosing males, we have to look through the brain of the female to understand some basic things about how she perceives variation in these traits. And this isn't surprising to us. In this painting by Picasso, Girl Before a Mirror, what we see is this girl is looking at her reflection, and the reflection that she is seeing is nothing like, in quotes, what she really looks like. And Picasso said in reference to this painting, who has the better view of beauty? Is it the painter? Is it the photographer? Is it the girl? Is it the mirror? And the answer that Picasso implies is that it's all of these, because our, our aesthetic preferences are something that is internal to us, not that it can't be influenced by cultural situations, but if, we see a, if I see a painting, and if I look at Girl Before a Mirror, if I say, that's a beautiful painting, you can't say to me, no, it's not a beautiful painting, because I get to, as our, as our infamous governor and president, George Bush, once said, I'm the decider. And that's what it is with females when they choose mates. They're the deciders. The females are not, are not under selection to figure out which males are more beautiful. The males are under selection to make themselves more beautiful to the females. So what that suggests is that the brain, and when I'll use the brain as shorthand, meaning sensory end organs, perceptual processes, cognitive processes, all of these processes that animals use to acquire information about the environment, to process them, and then make decisions based on the processing of this information, all of these processes can bias what animals find attractive in sexual traits. So recently, um, a colleague of mine in my department, Molly Cummings, Molly and I reviewed hundreds of studies that show evidence for the importance of perceptual biases in influencing mating preferences in animals. So these perceptual and cognitive and sensory biases are widespread through the animal kingdom. And this get, just adds a lot more evidence to 
the importance of understanding these neural and cognitive mechanisms that are important when the animals are making decisions about whom to mate. So as John pointed out, I've been studying this little species of frog, the tuber of frog, in Latin America for, very, for many years. The tuber of frog is about 30 millimeters in length. It's very nondescript, at least when you look at it. It breeds in the rainy season, which in Panama is roughly from May until uh, November or December. And we've studied this frog throughout its entire range. We've sampled calls and tissues for genetic analysis from northern Mexico through Central America, down through the Darien Gap, into uh, one particular valley in Colombia where they're isolated, the Magdalena Valley, and that add, then add on to the Llanos of the Great Plains of Venezuela. So by comparing vocalizations and behavior of these per, uh, 30 different populations, I can assure you that what I'm going to tell you about these populations that we've studied in Central America, as far as we can tell, applies very much to all, to all the populations. So like a lot of frogs, these frogs call at night in small puddles of water. Males come to the breeding site. They stay stationary while they're calling. And then while they're calling, females come to the breeding site. Females can sit in front of a male, and they're not molested by the male. In, some, in lots of animals, males will have strategies where they try to force matings with females. That's not true in these. And the females will often sit in front of one male, move to another male, move to another male, before they decide with whom, with whom they're going to mate. And the, way they, the way they show, they exhibit this decision, is they, they swim back to the calling male, and they swim into the calling male, and the male clasps them from the top. And that's Amplexus. Now there's about five or 6,000 species of frogs, and almost all species of frogs call. Every species of frog calls has a distinct species-specific call. Now, when I use the term species-specific, that's not to suggest that there's necessarily been selection for species recognition. I use that as a statistical statement that even though there's variation within the species, most of the variation in calls of frogs are partitioned among rather than within species. So I can go into choruses in Florida, in Panama, in the Amazon, and just by reminding myself what species are there, I can identify 10, 20, 30 different species of frogs, just as birders in sites with lots of different bird species can identify even more species of birds merely by listening to them. So this call, this call is very important in mate choice. It is by far the most important courtship character of the animals. And as I'll talk about in a bit, we also know a whole lot about how the brain of frogs are wired to make the females more responsive to calls of conspecific individuals than heterospecific individuals. Of course, there's strong selection on females to mate with conspecifics because heterospecific matings usually don't pro, uh, produce viable offspring. So when I started this research, the call, and, and, and it continues, the call is kind of the central uh, part of the courtship display. Now the tumor frog has an interesting call. What we see here are, I guess that doesn't work except for me. Um, what we see here are sonograms and oscillograms of the mating call. So the call has two components. It always has a whine, as we see here, and all males can produce just a whine, but they can also add chucks to their call. So what we see here are calls with one chuck, two chucks, three chucks, and they can make up to seven of these chucks. So what causes, what modulates the variation in this call complexity? Well, it's social interactions with other males. So if a male's calling by himself in a pool of water, he produces only a whine. If there's other animals calling, then he's much more likely to transit to making a call with one chuck, a call with two chucks, a call with three chucks. And then when they drop chucks, they tend to drop the chucks one at a time and go back to producing only a whine. So I'll play this call for you, and we'll hear actually these, these exact four calls. A wine, a wine with one chuck, two chucks, and three chucks. Now, I'm going to give you guys a treat. I'm going to do it again, because that's one of the most amazing sounds in nature, and you're probably not going to ever get to hear it again. 
And it's very easy to manipulate the call complexity of these frogs. So if a male's calling in a pool by himself, and he's call, he'll be making only a whine, yeah, yeah. and if I say to him or anyone says to him, yeah, yeah, then he'll say, yeah, yeah. and then if I say, yeah, 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 he'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then on a good night, I can get them to make three chucks sometimes, but very rarely four chucks. So with this vocal competition, it's vo this vocal competition that causes them to increase the call complexity. But what are they competing for? What do animals usually compete for? Food or sex? And they're not calling to get food, so it seems likely that they're calling to get sex. One of the advantages of working with frogs for mate choice studies is that the only function of this long distance mating call is to attract females and repel neighboring males. The females only come to the breeding site when they're going to breed, when they're in reproductive condition. And this species, when they arrive, they have to mate that night because they ovulate while they're in the pond and all of their legs will be, eggs will be lost if they don't mate. The only reason that a female frog will show phonotaxis towards a male is in the context of choosing a mate. So we wanted to know, um, we wanted to know what, why males added chucks to their calls, and the obvious hypothesis was that it makes them more attractive to females. The males on the top here are the females on the bottom, and the way they got like this was by the female swimming into the male, and the male clasped the female from the top. Now one of the nice things about tuber frogs is after a couple of hours they then construct this foam nest. You can see one of the eggs right here. There's about 250 eggs. Once they're done constructing the nest, then they leave and there's no parental care. So females aren't getting any kind of immediate benefit, any obvious immediate benefit from mating, from mating with males. When we're doing surveys of tuber frogs in different places in Latin America, it's very easy to find the frogs because it's almost like looking for where a fraternity had a party. You can just see all the beer cans lying around. So we just walk through the forest and the fields until we see pools of water with all of these foam nests. And then we know this is a place where we can go back to the next night. But as I said, the advantage of working with, and advantage of working with frogs for these kinds of studies is it's very easy to ask the females, what do you find attractive? What are the kinds of sounds that are more likely to get a male a mate? And we do this in phonotaxis experiments. We collect animals in the field, in amplexus. We bring them back to the lab. And we put them in a, uh, a walk-in acoustic chamber. We put the female in the middle of the chamber underneath a, uh, underneath a funnel. Which we, and then we shut up the chamber. We can um, raise the funnel remotely. We video record under infrared light. This is all done in the dark. The responses of the female, and the experiments can be very simple. We, in this case, we wanted to know, do males get a reproductive advantage by producing a chuck? So we do a funnel attack taxis experiment, so we give the females a choice between a wine, er, and a wine chuck, er, er. She's in the middle of the arena. For her, she, when she makes contact with the speaker, we consider that she's showing a choice, that she has a preference. And if we were to scale these distances to human body size, she would have to travel 80 meters to go from the center of the arena to the speaker. So it's a pretty serious task. She's not going to happen to hop in the wrong direction and, uh, and choose the speaker. So we did this, and we, we've done this experiment many times. This is an old slide. Our, uh, our sample size is about, uh, I think, six or 7,000 now. But we give the females a choice between a, a synthetic wine chuck and a synthetic wine. So the wine is exactly the same. All that varies is this synthetic chuck. And what we see is that the females are five times more likely to respond to the complex call than they are to respond to the simple call. Very strong preference for the complex call. We have data over about 20 years now, and the strength of this preference, 0.85 to 0.15, doesn't vary that much over, hasn't varied that much over the last two decades. And I, our sample sizes are always at least 100, so we have a very robust measure of this preference over time. Now this is pretty amazing if you think about it. When a, female, when a male adds a chuck to the call, he's increasing the duration of the call by only 10%. He's increasing the amount of energy in the call only by 10%. 
and he's not significantly changing the frequency range. <coughs> so basically what he's doing, he's making a long air and then adding this little burp uh, at the end of it. And he increases his attraction by 500% by burping at the end of his call. <laughs> so I've thought every once in a while, can we think of any traits in humans where let's say a human male could put on a trait that's pretty darn cheap and it makes it increases his chance of mating with a female by 500%. And I can't think of any. And if anybody else can, don't tell me, get a patent and start to sell it. <laughs> it takes them nothing, nothing to make this job. Okay, so now what we know is that sexual selection generated by female preferences causes the evolution of complex calls in these animals. Now what we'd like to know is, what is it about the brain, what is it about the auditory system that makes these calls more complex? So again, this is going back to Darwin's emphasis that there must be something internal to the animal that generates these particular sexual aesthetics for these different kinds of traits. Well, in the frog, this system was well worked out for species recognition by Bob Kopranica, who was an engineering student at MIT and then worked at Bell Labs for many years, then moved to Cornell um, in the department that I went to, where he continued to work on a very basic question. How does the frog's brain extract biologically relevant information from a noisy background? And the frog's auditory system, it's a vertebrate auditory system, but it has some differences from all, almost all other vertebrate taxa. And that is it has two inner ear organs. We have one, the cochlea. Frogs have two, two on each side of the head. And one here, one is called the amphibian papilla, and the other is called the basal papilla. Both of these inner ear organs are innervated by nerves from the eighth cranial nerve, or the auditory nerve. This nerve leaves the inner ear, goes to the brain, it goes to the high brain, to the, uh, to the high brain where processing starts. Now, unlike the mammal, uh, uh, mammalian auditory system, these two inner ear organs start doing a whole lot of the processing of conspecific sounds immediately upon hearing the sound. And Kopranica referred to this as the match filter hypothesis. Now these end organs, these end organs are different in a lot of ways. The most important difference is that the AP, the amphibian papilla, is more sensitive to lower frequency sound, sound be sounds below about 1200 hertz. The basal papilla is most sensitive to sounds above 1200 hertz. Now within each of their sensitivity ranges, there will be a much narrow range of frequency to which each inner ear organ is most sensitive. And what Kopranica suggested, in which the data support very, very strongly, is that the tuning of these two peripheral end organs match the dominant frequencies in the frog's mating call. And that's what we see here. The amphibium, the tuning of the amphibian papilla matches the dominant frequency of the wine, and the tuning of the basal papilla matches the dominant frequency of the chuck. So you have these two different call components, the wine and the chuck, that match the tuning of each of these peripheral end organs. So this is where a lot of the processing takes place. Now we also know about, an awful lot about how processing takes place in the central nervous system. So we've done a number of studies uh, with my colleague Walt Wolzinski, who's worked on both the electrophysiology of the peripheral auditory system, and then with Kim Hope, uh, doing immediate early gene studies on the brain. And just to summarize, a very large number of studies, what we find is that the main auditory nucleus in the frog, the torus semicircularis, shows much more IEG expression, which is a proxy for neural excitation, in response to the wine chuck compared to the wine, and in response to the wine to other control stimuli. We also see that in the hypothalamus, we get correlated responses in the hypothalamus in, in areas of the brain that are part of the vertebrate social decision-making network. We also see in one part of the reward system, in the ventral tegmental area, we get greater neural firing in response to complex and simple conspecific calls than to control stimuli. 
And even in motor areas of the brain, we again see these correlated patterns of firing that are particular to this, um, deci this decision-making network in vertebrates, where we get higher uh, patterns of correlated firing in response to conspecific and wine shut calls than we do to heterospecific. So we know an awful lot about how the brain is decoding a lot of this information. Now, what about the chuck? So we have this system, right? We have this system where the peripheral auditory system and the central nervous system are all biased in the female to showing greater response to wine chuck than to wine, and this maps right on to her behavioral preference for wine chuck versus wine. So, this seems then that this must be a very well coordinated system where sender and receiver, chooser and quarter, have evolved together where there's been very tight coevolution of the properties of the call along with the perceptual and sensory processes that decode the call. And this is what we thought was true for a long time, is what Copranica always thought was true, the evolution of species recognition, and at least in these frogs, it's demonstrably not true. So what, we, what Walt and I did a number of years ago, we collected a number of species, close relatives to Pustulosis and the sister tax of Peter's eye, which is found only in Amazonia, and we've worked with Peter's eye a lot. And Peter's eye has some populations that make chucks and other populations that don't make chucks. And it's very interesting because we know what the frogs need in their larynx to make a chuck. And all the tumor frogs have this structure in the larynx. And the Peter's eye that don't make chucks don't have a larynx that can make chucks. And the ones that do make chucks have a larynx that can make chucks. So what this suggests to us is that the chuck and the morphology for producing the chuck probably evolved once in the common ancestor of Pustulosis and Peter's eye. All of these other species of Physolemus, they all produce wines. So for instance, uh, Colorodorum sounds like this. Yeah. The Peter's eye wine sounds like yeah, a little bit longer. NSFE, you guys don't have to deal with the National Science Foundation, but the NSFE sounds like this. <laughs> 